Okay, that's good. All right. Welcome, everybody. As I said before, this is a recording of the Agile uh, Agile podcast. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, please use the chat if you'd like to be as uh, in part of our conversation. Um, but we will kick off uh, the way we'd normally kick off the recording now. So welcome to the Agile Revolution. I'm Craig. And I'm Tony. Hey, Tony. And I'm Renee. Renee, uh, Craig, Tony, Renee, band. Uh, for those of you who listened to before, we are, uh, we are at uh, the Agility Today 2021 Unconference. Um, what's an unconference, Tony? I don't know, but it feels very un. Very good. Renee, you've been yeah, to an unconference? I've switched on today. I've been to multiple unconferences before, but generally an unconference is uh, less structured and emergent, more emergently structured in the moment. Uh, just so that's pretty much our podcast, un yeah, unstructured. It <laughs> comes true. towards the structure in the moment. Well, welcome to everybody. We've got uh, a whole pile of people uh, who are attending the unconference uh, in our in our room, and uh, hopefully we'll hear some of their voices as we move through the session. So uh, we'll be welcoming them to to join us in the chat. But the theme that the unconference was uh, taking on, and the the theme that we were asked to talk about, is rapid adaptation strategies. So uh, we've been through this, uh, you know, period as we all know um, of. Uh, uncertainty of uh, you know the, the pandemic and, and medical and, and then other things have just been happening in the world alongside that uh, you know there's, there's been you know different uh, political uh, types of uh, unrest in different countries and uh, and uh, climate change and all those type of things we're just in a in a very interesting period right now and so um, you know we're all here because uh, you know agility is at our as our core at our base I want to talk a little bit about how we can use those uh, use our uh, our agility superpower I guess for want of a better word uh, to help us move through. So, you know, Renee, what, what are your thoughts around, um, you know, sort of where the world is right now and what agility means to us? Um, okay, so I didn't think we'd be starting there, but um, I, I guess, you know, there's definitely a need for more um, response to disruption these days. So dealing with that VUCA world that you were talking about, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, et cetera, um, I think we need to have techniques that are going to be able to support working smarter um, and getting to those outcomes more effectively than maybe we have before. But if we have a look at how Agile can potentially answer that, I think Agile's got a lot of solutions in this toolkit for that. Though I'd say... Um, we're probably not where we need to be in the world yet in actually reaching Agile. I think, you know, there's a lot of fragile out there, um, but uh, it would be great to talk a bit more around some of the anti-patterns that we're seeing and what that actually means for iterative delivery. Yeah, what about for, you, Tony? Yeah, for my thoughts on that, I, I think um, agility superpowers that we, we need to harness given, given the environment we're in, right? It's highly volatile, as Renee said, that VUCA world. And, you know, the ability of agility, ooh, it rhymes even, Gives you, gives you that power to be able to inspect and adapt and move and shape fast, right? When it all comes down to it, we, we need to actually be able to collaborate a lot quicker, a lot faster, and a lot more succinctly than we had before. And those short, sharp cycles give us that. It creates that collaborative connective tissues. Why? Why is that super important to us? Because I think we're going to be making a lot of directional decisions and we're going to be making them at speed and we're going to be making them more often. So we want that information flow that that collaboration gives us and then gives us that ability to inspect and adapt and pivot to what's happening in the, in the environment. Craig, what do you think? Um, I think you shouldn't take up poetry, Tony. The ability and agility <laughs> is probably the worst thing I've ever heard. Um, Renee, I'm, I'm actually kind of interested. You, know, you sort of said that you're not sure where we're going to start. So I'm interested in um, you know, where should we start on this conversation to bring some more people in? I mean, I think if I if I have a look at, you know, the topic area of rapid adaption strategies, I think, you know, actually, it's funny, I think back to the um, days in the 90s and 2000s around RAD and how um, we had these processes that didn't really um, meet the expectations of the hype. Um, and if I look at Agile, I feel like in some cases it's not always meeting the hype. Um, you know, you look at some of the elements around craftsmanship and so forth. I, I just don't feel like we've gotten fully down that pathway correctly. You look at 
some of the agile implementations, um, you know, we still don't have cross-functional teams. It's we've got business teams and IT teams and each each of them are doing agile separately from each other. I think there's just a lot of challenges out there that there's agile lip service um, and there's a lot of work to be done to educate leaders to get the right approach moving forward. Yeah, I like the word. I like the word hype there. Um, that uh, you know, I think a, a lot of um, you know, we were talking before we came on air about uh, you know agile transformations and the word transformation, and 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 now it's all about digital transformations. And and I feel there's more hype and ceremony and uh, and and things to to actually understanding what that means, which is making a true change. And what worries me about a lot of uh, agile implementations um, or you know just uh, people trying to do this is that um, there's a lot of talk about what we do and a lot of talk about the process, but when it comes down to actually making a real change and making you know a real difference and actually getting rid of some of the old processes, um, what I see a lot of is a, you know an agile wallpaper over the top of just an existing process, and that just makes it worse for everybody. Yeah, yeah, the silos become chasms in that in, in that, that sort of environment, right? And I think you know, um, the, we were a part of a reflection of the of the last twenty years of agile and, and what's going to happen with agile. While you know, last week was part of the reflect uh, um, festival, and I was on another one where we were talking through it. One of the strong things that's come out through a number of the ones that I've been through is leadership, and you even mentioned it just then, right? So leadership, there's a lot of poking at the leadership and saying, "Well, you need to do." What have we done as a community though to help them with the adaptive strategies to, to move from that archetypal, you know, leadership that they're all used to, the command and control? Because remember, and I say it all the time to everyone, the minute you start using agility, that disseminates control by its very right. That's what it's meant to do, right? But that only leaves leaders that, that have always worked in that, that kind of environment, one lever to pull, and that's command. How do we help them? How do we move that forward? Renee, Craig? Well, actually, I want to I want to bring uh, Julian um, into this uh, conversation. Julian Smith, who um, I'm, I'm speaking with a little later in this uh, unconference about uh, uh, public sector agility. Um, what role do you think? Um, you know, you, you sort of uh, you know, mentioned that you know empathy is a big part of this. Um, so you know, tell us a little bit about that, Julian, and uh, and just you know you, what you're seeing in relation to public sector agility, given that you uh, you play a role in the Australian government. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. And uh, for all those um, as well, Craig mentioned that we're doing a presentation a bit later about public sector agility, particularly for governments or large organisations. Um, so check that out later today. It'll be, it'll be fantastic. But probably get, touching back, back to what Tony mentioned about leadership. And I, th I think you made a really good point about how, how we can actually kind of enable our leaders to actually enable stuff to iterate and, and, and what have you. And kind of tying back into that empathy question, particularly if we're looking um, to help kind of drive agility, if we're looking to get closer to our end customers and test our assumptions and our hypotheses with them and also collaborate to what Renee was talking about before, how do we actually collaborate? So, so I guess for me, it kind, of, kind of reminds me a bit about empathy. How can we kind of build empathy as leaders for our staff? How can we build within our teams empathy with each other to collaborate? But also how can we build, importantly, empathy for our citizens or for our customers or whoever your customers are so we're, we actually have a very good definition of what value is and we can actually test it. So it's, a, it's an interesting part that I've been um, trying to wrap my head around. Um, but, yeah, I was just really interested in the panels that thought thoughts on that too about, about what, what you kind of see is the role of empathy, particularly with, with agility. Um. I'm going to grab one of those quickly, Jill. <laughs> um, so situa situational empathy for me is, is, is become even more important. And can I say, now that we've moved into this particular phase, given what's happened uh, over the period of time, um, and we've moved into remote, you know, our work is in our home and our home is in our work. And I think that becomes more important now that, the, that we think about that situational empathy and thinking about the fact that, you know, People have got children running around or you've got to take kids to school or, you know, you're facing different challenges than you've ever faced before. So, and, and that, that, that harks to both leadership and both people that are doing the work. 
But I think for our, for our leaders, it, it also means how do, how, do, how do they balance that empathy with getting work done and being leaders? And it's, it's not going to be an easy balance. So that's where we come in, you know, the onus is on the Agile community, I think, to help them. Renee? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge advocate for human connection um, and empathy being a, a, obviously a very critical element of that. I think vulnerability um, being probably a key trait that not enough leaders demonstrate um, because it's not safe in a lot of our workplaces to be vulnerable. Um, and if you're not safe to be vulnerable, then can you actually ever be really comfortable to be fully empathetic, to be your full self in those sorts of environments. So I think that's a real challenge in a number of organisations because it's not, it's still not considered okay to be empathetic, to be deeply empathetic as a leader. Like I, I know it sounds crazy, but it's not seen as an incredibly important trait. It's just seen as a trait. And I think we would need to amplify that a lot more in order to make a significant difference in being able to be more connected to our people, but also to customers as well. I mean, that that right. kind of raised a raised a question for me because it comes back to I think to the to the hype um, you know we were talking about before because. Uh, the buzzword for the last few years has been this idea of psychological safety and uh, you know, every sort of talk I go to about leadership and, and things has that in there. And it's a very important part. It was built into modern agile, but, um, but what can we do? Like the, the problem with this is it's, it's a very hard thing to teach. It's a very hard thing, even sometimes to, uh, you know, to ensure what, what are your thoughts around that Renee um, in, in relation to how do we actually, make this happen rather than just talking about it, which I feel is what yeah. we do more yeah. of. There's definitely techniques out there to build psychological safety. I think obviously um, you'd be starting with what you say you're going to do, you do do. Um, it's about enabling an environment of divergent collaboration. And the way that you do that is by not speaking first as a leader, by speaking last as a leader and encouraging techniques where you know, brainstorm, every individual has an opportunity to brainstorm. You bring that information together and collectively as a team, you help to prioritise and determine the best path forward than necessarily as a leader, um, you, you're actually presenting that. I think there's also elements around language that you use um, and that's going to take a lot longer than a minute to answer. But, you know, um, asking, inquiring more rather than directing more is, is another enabler to creating yeah. that safety. Um, and as I mentioned, vulnerability, you know, telling stories um, are incredibly important of where you've failed or that, that bring uh, almost like the two sides of your life together. I mean, I, it's hard to describe, but once in my life I was a manager and I actually really re saw the difference between myself at work and myself as a human being at home. And really what I think we need to do is, uh, as a leader is integrate those two more. But to do that, you actually need to understand how to introspect. And a lot of leaders don't have time and the headspace. There's so much going on. There's so much pressure on them that they just can't step back and don't have the techniques to introspect. So that's actually where I'd start on almost everything. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, invite, I, think, uh, what, I was going to say, yeah, I want to invite um, a, couple of the, a couple of the comments in. Um, while we're doing this. So uh, I'm going to invite Manish, uh, who's been sort of talking in the, in the chat to join us. Tony, but you want to finish your thought first and then we'll get Manish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to chime in with Renee because obviously the three of us talk a lot. We, we, we agree exactly where you're at there, Renee. But I think it's also, we had the pleasure of talking with David Marquet just recently, you know, and that um, language is leadership and about how you change your leadership. But I think one of the most poignant points I got out of it was leaders, you know, you're saying when, you, when you're helping leaders, leaders, don't have the opportunity to say, hey, I don't know everything. I'm going to try this and I might get it wrong. And I think we have to give them that opportunity as much as we have to give our people that as well. But it's not often seen right for leaders to do that. So um, yeah, move over to Manish now. I'd love to hear from some Yeah, Manish, so um, uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the empathy topic and uh, what do you think about this topic? Yeah, thanks. So uh, 
see, I, I was referring to what Rene was sharing. So uh, in terms of introspection, so I think uh, if I look back, there had been instances where in my you know current capacity, so one of the option was to give deadlines to people that okay you have to do this work you you know you prefer doing the agile way and you, yeah. you get the work done it did not work that well because primarily it was the leaders who were doing the talking you know getting the minimal support from the folks so the second approach was that you know we give the people that okay you tell us that how much time would you need and during that process during that introspection process we get to understand their you know challenges their fears their worries you know that's the human connect which empathy also talks about right so if we try to get a balance of getting the people to take the ownership of their own tasks and in the process understanding people as well so i think the latter worked for me better where we get from people that okay this is what we want to do this is how we plan to do and this is when we will actually do so that worked well for me so that is what i was referring to that there might has to be a balance between both of them so i you know definitely second tony's thought as well that empathy the balance and then rene's thought as well to introspect more while we you know understand this uh, more concretely i think that's mm -hmm. my take on this well said well said and well said Manish. um naresh i want to invite you in um because uh, you sure. sort of had a thought about uh, speaking last as a leader naresh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a bit of crosstalk going on there. If we could meet a few people there, uh, but Naresh, uh, you there? Yep. Uh, thanks, Craig. So, yep, I'm quite congruent about what Rini talked about. You know, speaking last as a leader or people. Quite often than not, I've seen on the fact that you know who's the uh, in the room who is having you know a high pitch on the tone, uh, they would be over hard with the others. So especially in the setting, an you know, organizational setting, when leaders are more uh, aggressive in terms of bringing uh, deliverables, so their voice is you know much more stronger than others. So I think. That is where my perspective of, uh, you know, being congruent that, you know, we need to allow people in the room to be, you know, to be heard than spoken. So that's a great one, in fact. Charlie. Yeah, excellent. Excellent comment. Um, also, uh, wanted to uh, invite Anuj into the, uh, into the uh, conversation as well. You've had a couple of interesting comments along the way, Anuj. Hi, Craig. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think just uh, something that kind of struck with me was Rene, your thought around uh, divergent collaboration, right? I've just noted it down. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, as people, we just need others to function well. And, and uh, I have seen this in my experience where unless we see the support from leaders and peers of ex peers as well, you will not be able to function at a, at a, at a at a level that you really want to function, right? And um, we, we obviously we're not machines, right? We need, we have emotions, we have value systems, we have aspirations, right? So many, so many of these things which have been kind of categorized under soft skills, and a leader should have some of these, which is okay to have. But at 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 in the current stage, even more, um, all of these uh, vulnerabilities and um, emotional agility and being there for your team and psychological safety is just absolutely necessary for us to function right now. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think um, one of the interesting things I was talking to someone just, uh, just this week, I was coaching some, some leaders and, and um, one of the comments that was made was that, you know, um, the soft skills have been left on the table with the rush to move and adapt to what's happened to us that the focus was deliver, deliver, get us back to normal, get us to some shape where we can get everything going, you know, send people home, put them on a table, whatever you need to do. Now it's time to pivot and think about those soft skills because if we don't, you know, we're going to find, you know, face burnout. We're going to face all sorts of things that, 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 that haven't happened in such a great uh, amount before. It's interesting. Really? I've, I've actually seen the opposite where there was a lot of, you know, up, up front, there was a lot of soft skills initially. And now because it's gone on for such a period of time, people are forgetting to reiterate or reemphasize those techniques. 
Um, but Anuj, I did want to sort of touch on something that you said there for a moment around leaders and what it's like for leaders. One thing I do see that we don't talk enough about is leaders are also in teams as well. And commonly, um, you know, leaders don't tend to think of themselves as a team member. They think of themselves as the manager. And I see a real shift in how we can actually bring leaders on the journey more by actually reconnecting them with their peers and doing it that at all levels of the organizations to to truly align on outcomes i don't think we we do enough enough of that focus tony what do you what do you think that is um because i know you do a lot of work i mean we all do a lot of work with leaders um so uh but uh you know why do you think the the, the leadership team uh, perhaps doesn't exhibit the same traits that, uh, that they expect of the teams below them? I think there's a couple of things around that. One of the ones that I often see is expectation. You know, it's the expectation that the leader is at the forefront. The leader tells everybody what to do. Um, and the leader knows all the answers, right? We see that all the time. And, you know, one of the good questions I had of our leader recently was, why are you telling that developer or that development group how to develop? Have you ever cut code? How long ago was it you cut code? Do you know how to do that, right? And what makes you think you've got the right answers? So it's, it's talking to them about the fact that, you know, check your expectations at the door, what you're doing with your teams and what you're expecting of your, your organisation in terms of that is actually an expectation of yourselves. And it's giving them, giving them the tools to sort of work through that as well. Remember, this is a big change, right? Yeah, it's a huge, huge change. Yeah, you go, Craig. You know, I, was just, I, was, I was just going to add to that, that what one of the things that's really worried me um, is that uh, I see so many, I'm going to call them managers because I, I don't want to call them leaders in this uh, in this mm -hmm. forum, but so many managers who, um, you know, they might be the, the manager of the development um, team or the manager of the, you know, a particular section. And they actually really have no idea what their um, teams or staff are doing because they're so busy just being in the next Outlook meeting. Uh, they're just going from meeting to meeting to meeting, but the leadership that the team needs and just stopping and going, you know, what do you need? How can I help? Rather than just saying, give me a status report so I can just read that on the run to the next meeting. We've got to change that that leadership balance, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, I, I took a manager to task just recently, though, with a, you know, the leader of a development section. And I, and I went, you know, when was the last time you actually had a conversation with your developers about code and about, you know, coding standards and things like that? And it's just something they've never done. They're always just always talking about the, you know, the process and the mechanics. You know, those things are super important because that's what those people do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want to thank Anuj, he's got sort of the comment there, you know, leadership's an action, not a position. I think that's a, that's a great way of, um, you know, of, uh, of thinking, thinking of that. Um, yeah, good point. So before, before you pivot, just really importantly, one, one comment here. You know, we're harping on a little bit about leaders and managers here. I think it's really important, just re-looping back to empathy here. We need to be empathetic with the position that leaders are in. Yes. Um, we need to start from that position of empathy and understanding the situation that they're in before uh, before we even try and say we're going to transform you. I think that's probably the wrong answer here. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a great segue to bring in Raju, who uh, has just asked a question in the in the chat. So I'm going to um, bring you and Raju to actually ask that question directly to uh, uh, to us. Yeah, hi guys, uh, great talk so far, excellent discussion, and uh, and this kind of segues into what we we're just discussing, because one of the dysfunctions of you know agile transformation is that most of the organizations they do claim to be agile, even though they have managed traditionally through you know, traditional bureaucracy, which kind of goes to the leadership as, as well. And, I, and you rightly said, I mean, they're not leaders, they're managers. So what are your thoughts? I mean, and how do we correct that dysfunction? Because I think that's, that's obvious across the globe in almost every organization. Thank you. That was Niraj, not uh, Raju. Oh, sorry, I thought you, I was supposed to be. All, All, good. This is All good, we'll go there. All right, okay. apologize. No, that's fine. Um, Tony? I, look, again, I, I, this connects back, right back to the beginning because when I said it, you know, I, I started out by saying that, that you, we actually actually have to think about the leaders and do they have the right tools? This is a big change and it's that empathy towards them. And we as the agile community and when we're working with them have to think about that focus because it's easy when you go in there to just start working with the teams. It's easy when you go in there to focus on 
you know, getting all those connections horizontally. But uh, again, hopping back to what Renee was saying, it's really that connection of the horizontal and the, and, and the vertical and making sure that they're actually working together and they're actually leading, not just managing, as you said. So, so I have a lot of I have a lot of empathy towards leaders because I can see that this is a really hard time. Um, and given the organisation, sometimes the structure of them when they're trying to move into agility, sometimes that structure and what's required of them creates that bureaucracy as well. So it's also looking at how can we help them within that. Um, Craig or Renee? I mean, I guess I'd I'd start from a position of look, I'd work with leaders that want to change for a start. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't try and push agile onto leaders that aren't ready for it. And then I think for, for leaders that probably are ready for it, I think, you know, the answer is actually not insert agile processes and practices. The, the answer is, what are your problems? How can I help you to solve your problems? It's designing for that organizational context, right? So when that gets on our hobby horse of don't throw in the cookie cutter solution, it's not going to fix your problem. Yeah. Yeah, and I think and I think one of the problems is that uh, you know one of the first things people do when they uh, when they're taking on a uh, you know any sort of uh, digital or agile transformation or you know even just trying to do something new is the first thing they roll is the restructure word, you know which uh, which, which strikes fear into into yeah. in, into everybody in the organisation, and so then we get tarred with this brush of restructure because. You know, people at their heart, you know, we're not being empathetic to their feelings, which is, am I going to have a job after this? You know, I wonder if we're not if even we're going empathetic. To... It's just, it's downright antithesis to agile, to be honest. Yeah. And so I wonder whether, um, you know, one of the things we've got to do is actually stop, you know, doing the restructure and start doing the unstructure. And if we truly want this to be successful, we've got to start, you know, dismantling some of those things. But, you know, what um, Naraj, I think, his point here was is that, you know, this bureaucracy is so strong, we have to, we have to unbolt some of that because, you know, we're trying to fit, you know, a square peg into a round hole and that uh, um, you know, we, we have to do something more fundamental at an organisational level to make that um, truly the case. Um, Renee, I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, given that, you know, you do often uh, get to get that seat at the table when organisations are going through, um, you know, a, a transformation like that. Um, what is their openness to, um, you know, to, to thinking about this, the structure differently? Does that ever get on the table? Or Structure actually tends to be on the C-suite's mind very early in the conversation. And typically the reason why is not what everyone thinks that it would be. So, you know, when I talk about it, um, you know, the reason why I would opt to put it on the table is how can we create value through cross-functional teams with less dependencies? That's the, that's the lens I take. However, when leaders think about it, um, to be brutally honest, they see roles such as product owners and scrum masters, and then all these digital roles like UX specialists and data scientists and so forth that they need to hire. They see dollar marks. This is going to cost me a lot of money. I need to bring in consulting companies or other training companies. That's going to cost me a lot of money. And so on top of this, they think, you know, I need to do a restructure, not just for these new roles, but also because I actually need to cost out to be able to afford all these new roles and all this training and this new culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do want to come back because I did invite um, uh, Raju, Raju Gupta into the conversation. So I do want to make sure that we, uh, that we come back to that question, which is, uh, you know, coming back to our empathy. So Raju, are you there? Do you want to, uh, do you want to ask your question? I guess uh, thanks, Craig, for uh, giving me a moment to talk about. So what I feel is that uh, until unless uh, you are core into the uh, system, like you know what the product is about, probably you would tend to be less empathetic towards your team. You need to know what the product looks like, what are its its intricacies, uh, what the um, what the challenges are you know so that uh, you can prove yourself to be a good leader uh, I think uh, the ones who have grown grown inside the organization as leaders that's why I feel they can be more empathetic because they are close to the product and they're close to the business yeah I think it's interesting I think uh, I wonder thank you Rajiv I think there's a um, 
there's, there's a thing that the longer you've been in the organization, the more you're just thinking about the, you know, the delivery, you almost take for granted uh, perhaps the, the team or the engine that, um, that goes through that. Whereas we all know sometimes when you join a new team, the first thing you have to do is get to know everybody and, and move that through. And I wonder whether there's a, an element of that um, that we don't do well enough, even though uh, you know, many agile books and practices talk about that need for a remobilization or that regeneration of the team. Um, you know, go read the work of Heidi Helfand and that, and that whole idea of um, you know, the fact that you know, teams are just you know, constantly regenerating um, you know, is a thing. Uh, yeah, I wonder whether it does, you know, um, get taken taken for granted, particularly if uh, you know perhaps you're the leader of a product team that is long running or you know is together. What, what are your thoughts, Tony? Yeah, it's that old familiarity, you know, breeds contempt, right? Which, you know, it, the, the the trouble is once you've been in, and I lived in an organisation for a very long time, over twenty years, right? And you actually get to the point where you can't see the wood for the trees. You actually have to you have to get that step back, and sometimes you do need you know, that, that new energy that comes in and says, hey, look at that. And you go, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that, right? Even, even yourself taking some time off and coming back and just looking at it or moving into a different role. So I think one of the things that you said there is about the leaders growing up, the, the hardest thing for a leader is to manage the teams that they actually grew up with, but it doesn't mean that they can't move into a different part or a different part of the organisation and take some of that experience with them. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of cycling leaders through the organization in different roles. Renee? I'm, I'm really mixed about this one, to be honest, because I, I mean, that. I know that, I know there's studies out there around, yeah. you know, rotating leaders being really great for the outcomes of an organization, but on a respect level, um, you know, maybe a leader has so much cognitive, cognitive load on them, so much happening in their life that rotating them will just bring them over the brink. So I think, you know, there's this balancing act between opting in for change, encouraging new thoughts and so forth versus being respectful um, to the environment and the situation that someone's in. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But look, it's it's a double-edged sword, and I think you have to do that. You have to try something, right? Just don't let it sit there. Try it. And I think that's what I, I – the reason I'm just jumping there is I, I want to sort of change gears and move a little bit to the right here and go, we've talked a lot about leadership in the adaptive strategies. That's okay. But I also want to ask the question around – and I'll touch on it, we've all touched on a little bit – is organisational design, right? So we see organisations right now reinventing themselves, readapting, reorganizing to meet the needs of what's happening. What do we think about that? Where do we stand on that? Craig? Yes, yes, they do, Tony. Yes, they do need to readapt. <laughs> <laughs> but how? Right? So so what I'm seeing from them, you know, is is there has there is a big thing out there at the moment is let's let's take the cookie cutter model. I'm not going to mention the music thing, but you know, Let's, let's jam that into our organisation. The conversation I'm having with a lot of them is, I know you, you need to use agility to reinvent, but just grabbing somebody else's model and putting that in, in that was meant for them and developed for them and putting that in your organisation, you've just taken all their problems and put it over the top of all your problems and now you've got double the amount of problems to try and figure out. So why would you do that? Thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, so in all, so in all seriousness, uh, Tony, uh, I think this comes back to, um, and, and Renee, uh, I know you've been talking about this for, for a lot of years as well, is that when we think about true business agility, you know, the problem is, is that we've, 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 met, we've sort of put agile with the IT side, right? And that's where uh, still, I, I don't know about all of you, but I would still say that 80% of the uh, things I get involved in, it's being led by the IT side of the fence. Um, when there's an IT side of the fence, we've still got a problem. We've still got a silo. Uh, you know, because the reality is, is that, you know, almost all organizations I work with, IT is just part of the delivery of the larger product, whatever it might be. Uh, there's a, you know, having them kind of separate is, is kind of a weird, uh, a weird thing. Um, I find that that is not such that's so much the case in software uh, companies themselves, because that is the business. But whenever you get into any sort of more traditional type businesses where you know, they become more digital, they really struggle uh, with this. And so, Business agility is not just taking stand-ups and retrospectives and all the other you know, team-based structures and shoving them into the rest of the business. It's actually about saying, how are we as an organization going to be more agile, which means we need to have the, um, have the tough conversations and the, and the tough um, you know, look at ourselves and go, actually, what does this mean for us to be a much more efficient organization? Renee? I mean, I think almost what we're missing here is the 
And I know that Lean didn't quite successfully get over the line with this, but Lean took the approach of, you know, start with where you are now and just continuously get better, solve problems as you go. And I think, you know, the intent of business agility ultimately, you know, I, th I think there's these two lenses of transform versus incrementally improve. I think there's not enough evidence out there, to be brutally honest, that you can transform a traditional organization into an agile organization. I think the only way that you can probably do it is small incremental steps. Um, and whether a company and organization can survive in that time, given disruption happening, then that's a big question mark for me. But in essence, you know, when you look at something like finance, for example, it isn't necessarily about completely throwing everything out tomorrow. What can you actually start to improve? How can you get a continuous improvement mindset in place in finance? And then maybe a few years down the track, people will actually discover that there's other ways of doing finance. Um, so I think, you know, is there ways to encourage more of a growth mindset throughout the organization as a jumpstart mechanism to true business agility? I see Sue, uh, Sim, Simwanza, you've got your hand up for a question, so we're happy. Sure. Please, so we have just lost. Question. Yeah, so just five minutes left, please. Over to you. Great. Sue, Sue Simwanza, I can see that you've got your hand up for a question. Please, please ask your question on us. It looks like we've lost Sue. Um, but uh, I, I think the other segue yeah. there is... Um, is uh, Sonali. Um, Sonali sort of uh, had a comment about transformation. Um, Sonali, do you want to join our conversation? Yeah, thanks, Craig. So uh, this is from my personal experience. I have worked into many organizations and most of the organizations say we are <laughs> agile, but for them, agile is like daily stand-ups, sprint planning, and they don't, don't even care about the sprint retrospectives because they don't have time for it. And they totally uh, fail to understand that retrospective is something which is the most important part of agile. So uh, I, I myself, I have transformed from a project master, a scrub master, and uh, I have learned the importance of agile, agile and the uh, processes uh, in last few years. Uh, and I am trying to be an advocate of it, trying to uh, tell a lot of people what. Agile is all about. It's not, not just the two, three ceremonies. Yeah. I'm, I'm desperate to jump in. Uh, there's very it's few it's things. It's there's very few things that I would say. You know, that's agile. That's not agile. I think you know, agile is such a broad umbrella that there's an awful lot of things that you could put under it. But fundamentally, if you are not inspecting and adapting both the product that you're delivering or the service that you're delivering and how you're delivering it. You are not doing agile. Yeah. Principle number 12, right? Yeah, principle number 12. I can't, I can't disagree. I think the other thing I took a lot to, to organizational leadership teams because I do a lot around the heart of agile. And, um, you know, the word we, we use is reflection, whether that be retrospection, introspection, whatever it be, right? You, you, you need to do that. And exactly what you're saying, the, the, both of you, is, is that I see a lot of organizations do what I call forest gumping, right? If you haven't seen the forest gump movie, He's off running and he just starts running and he keeps running and somebody gets to him and says, well, why are you running? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. Okay. When are you going to stop? Well, I don't know. And that's what companies do. The, the, the inherent problem with that is eventually that comes to a very big cataclysmic bang or things don't go as well as what they want. So it's changed that frame of talking to them about you need to reflect, you need to inspect and adapt and you need to take that so that you can improve. Because if you don't, your organization will either stagnate or you might not be here to see the next change. Hey, Craig? Tony, uh, you mentioned the heart of Agile. Who, uh, who, who's behind the heart of Agile? Uh -huh, you see, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's goading me because he wants me to, to play uh, Coburn Bingo, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. You mess up, Kirby, and everyone can take a drink. All right, uh, we're almost out of time here, so I, I do want to I do want to uh, wrap this up. So, some closing thoughts because uh, we talked a lot about leadership and design and all those uh, kinds of things. So, um, some closing thoughts, uh, Renee and Tony, about um, rapid adapt adaptation strategies. What can we do? Um, what what can what can the people on you know, take away from this and uh, you know, take back to their workplaces? Renee, think, ladies first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the easy answer for me is be the change yourself. So, 
you know, um, look at what you can do, the interactions that you can have, the empathy that you can bring to others, um, you know, the retrospective and the reflection that you can provide and the support that you can bring into the processes to help um, be more the, the person to actually be the change, to encourage the change in others and, and let others go, you know, what are you doing differently, you know, and ask you for help, ask you for answers um, than necessarily pushing it hard out there. Tony? Yeah, I concur. I concur with everything you said there. Uh, it's so easy. So I think if you're a leader or you're, a, you're, a, you're in a team, it's easy to put the flag in someone else's hand and say, go on. But it's not so easy to put the flag in your hand and say, come on. So be the change. Take, that, take the opportunity to, to you know, show people how to go forward. I always say educate, demonstrate, and then implement, right? So educate people about why you want to make these changes. Demonstrate how it works so that you can, they can see it and then implement it, right? Whether you're a leader, whether you're somebody working in the team, or you're a group of individuals working together to try to make this change. Craig? Yeah, agree with all those things. And I'd just say, you know, we often talk about the difference between doing agile and being agile. Being agile is a very hard thing to explain, but you know, let's stop talking about agile and let's stop talking about those things and come back to something you said before, Renee, which is understand the problem. Understand the problem that our, that our organizations are trying to, to solve. Um, and work towards that and use the toolkit and the toolboxes that we have out there, not just one framework, but the, but the wide variety of things uh, in order to solve it. Um, you know, sometimes that might be something that, uh, that you, you know, pick out of a book or, or, or borrow from somewhere. And sometimes it might be a combination of things. That's the, that's the real challenge for us. That's where true agility lies. Hey, Craig, what would you call it if you weren't going to call it agile? I think I'd call it raccoon, Tony. If you come to my later <laughs> session, you might see a raccoon. Uh, All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, wow. Wonderful uh, uh, sum up, right? I can say that that was uh, ending up with a good note. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony, Greg, and Renee for your time. So, so Vikram, we uh, have one. We... we have one last ask of everybody, if that's okay. The way the way we end this uh, way we end this podcast is that uh, we get everyone to join us in a Viva La Revolution. That's our tagline. So I'm going to ask everyone to go off uh, go off uh, mic right now onto onto mic off mute. Um, and on the count of three, Tony's going to count us because he does it so poorly. Um, Tony's going to count us in and we're going to do a Viva La Revolution to finish this podcast. So uh, uh, take yourself off mute and join us on the count of three, Tony. Goodness, the last sure. time we did uh, this, right. Tony, last time we, did this we had, a, we had a, a lag situation. All right, are you ready, everybody? One, yep. two, two, three. three. Viva la, Viva la revolution! revolution. Viva. <laughs> oh, see, we're going to do it again. We, we're going to do it again. Come on, quickly. One, two, One, two three. three. Viva, Viva la, la, la revolution! revolution. revolution. Right. So, ah, Zoom lag. Got to love it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Vikram. Over yeah. to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Lot, uh, right. Thanks, Crane and Renee and uh, Tony. Right. Uh, we would request if you can just spare some time and go to the network launch and uh, consulting partner for further questions. Thank you so very much. It was a wonderful experience uh, with all of you and uh, hope to see you soon in another five, 10 minutes with the next session. Thank you. Over to you. Bye.